السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفى سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه وبعد My dear viewers, welcome to another live edition of our program, Gardens of the Pious, and today's episode by the grace of Allah is number 377. Our phone numbers beginning with area code are 002-023-855-132, and um, you can also uh, watch us on the YouTube and send your questions to gardens at huda.tv. There is another number, area code 002 then zero. Uh, 1005469323 without any further ado inshallah today we will continue with the studying of uh, chapter number 140 that is the second episode in this chapter the chapter which is known as babul isti'dhani wa adabu seeking permission to enter into somebody's house and the etiquette relating to it Today's first hadith is hadith number 871 in the series of Gardens of the Pious. An Sahl ibn Sa'din radiyallahu anhu qal, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inama ju'ila listi'dhanu min ajli al-basar. Muttafaqun alayhi. What we have in today is a sound hadith agreed upon its authenticity. Narrated by a great companion, Sahl ibn Sa'd al Sa'idi, may Allah be pleased with him. He said that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Al Isti'dhan, which is seeking permission to enter into somebody's house, has been prescribed in order to restrain the sight, to restrain the eyesight from looking at something which you're not supposed to look at. Yani, in the past, people's houses didn't have locks and the door may be halfway open due to the excessive heat sometimes entirely open that they didn't have curtains windows so the purpose of seeking permission or saying assalamu alaikum it is me muhammad salah coming to visit you guys is so and so home all of that is to declare to the people who are inside that somebody is standing by the door. Seeking permission does not necessarily mean whatsoever that you are uh, welcome. We are allowed to end. Only whenever you are granted permission to enter. And if any person sought permission once, twice, and three times while leaving gaps in between, then in this case you should turn around without feeling any hurt feeling without feeling sorrow or grief without feeling upset from the host whom you are about to visit especially whenever you showed up without a previous appointment Sa'd ibn Ubadah radiyallahu an the chieftain of Al-Khazraj Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa visited him once and he said assalamu alaykum and Eventually, Sa'd and his family members said, Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa But they said that quietly. So he repeated the salam since he couldn't hear the reply the first time after leaving a gap, a few minutes in between. He said, Assalamu alaykum. Uh, it's me, Muhammad Rasulullah. And again, Sa'd ibn Ubad and his family answered quietly, and that was deliberately so that the Prophet ﷺ would say salam again and again and again because as salam is an invocation as we discussed before. But after the Prophet 
gave salam three times, he understood that either no one is home or whoever is home is home, but he is not really uh, allowed to enter right now for a reason or another. So his Rasulullah sallallahu they didn't feel any hurt feeling, rather he turned around and he walked away. So Sa'd ibn Ubadah rushed after him and said, Ya Rasulullah, by Allah we have been replying to you but quietly so that we hear more and more supplications from you for us. The catch in this hadith is min ajlil basar. The purpose of seeking permission is to alert the people who are in their house that somebody is by the door and he's seeking permission to enter. He may be given permission, he may not. And if you're not given permission, just turn around and uh, maybe you can come later or communicate later and shouldn't feel upset about it. Trying to poke into somebody's house or if the door is halfway open, or is a little tilted, and you try to see if somebody's inside is absolutely forbidden. Once a man did the same with the Prophet ﷺ, he said that, I could see you while you were combing your hair. The Prophet ﷺ was sitting in his room, and as you know that those rooms were built of mud, dead palm leaves, and so it may have some holes. So he was looking, sneaking, taking a look from one of the holes in the wall at the Prophet Sallallahu and he saw him while he was combing his hair. So when he said that to the Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet, peace be upon him, said that, have I known that you were, uh, you know, spying at me? I would have poked your eye with the, with the comb because you are not permitted to do that. What is the purpose of seeking permission? It's not to look is to restrain your sight from looking at what you're not supposed to look at. I'm in the privacy of my house. Maybe I just took off my clothes. I'm sitting comfortable with my beloved wife with a pair of shorts or trunks. I feel like I'm home, man. So when you sneak, when you spy on me, when you take a look from the window or if the curtain is a little uh, open or from the door, if it is not uh, fully closed, this is absolutely forbidden. Do not spy on one another. Is this spying? It's spying. I just wanted to know if somebody's home because I kept saying, hey guys, I'm here. And nobody said, come on in. And I could hear voices. I could hear some footsteps. Yes, we're inside. But uh, we're not interested in having guests now. Let's put it this way. How is that? So Islam teaches us that the purpose, the main purpose of seeking permission is to restrain your eyesight. Also, it means like when the man said to the Prophet Wasallam, am I supposed to seek permission or knock on the door before entering upon my mother? Like my mother is in her room or in her house. You know, houses back then were very tiny and little small houses, you know, uh, and the hall or the living room was like, you know, the door would open right away to the living room where people are sitting in their sleep clothes, they have taken off their clothes, you know. So if the door is tilted, if the door is half open and somebody is trying to look, they will see the aura. And what is the purpose of seeking permission is to restrain your eyesight so that you wouldn't see something which you're not supposed to see. When this man said, أَسْتَأْذِنُ عَلَىٰ أُمِّي Am I supposed to seek permission for entering upon my mother? She's my mother. She's my mother. The Prophet ﷺ handled it in a very nice way. He said, would you like to see her naked? He said, of course not. He said, that's why you got to seek permission. Maybe she's changing her clothes. Maybe she's answering the call of nature. She's taking a bath or a shower. And that is the main purpose. That is the wisdom behind seeking permission before entering on any person, even if this person, your little sister, your older brother, uh, your nephew, your mother, your daughter, even your daughter. Uh, come in. And the Sahaba narrated how they used to uh, knock on the doors of the Prophet ﷺ by using their fingernails like this. Not with the knuckles. Hey, I'm here. Open the door. I can hear you. I can see you guys from the whole of the... All of that is forbidden. This is out of respect 
they would do it like this. So if the Prophet ﷺ heard them, that means he's awake. And we have learned in the hadith of Al-Maqdad that when the Prophet ﷺ used to come home, كَانَ يُسَلِّمُ سَلَامًا يُسْمُعُ الْيَقْضَانَ وَلَا يُوْقِضُ النَّائِمْ So even when he comes home, he would say, Assalamu alaykum, quietly. So if somebody is awake, we'll get a chance to reply. And those who are asleep, they would not be disturbed. You know, I know many of our youth who go to college and have roommates in the dorm and so on. This is the right way to deal with your roommates. I know it's my room like it is his room or their room. But maybe because they had late classes, now they're asleep. So you can simply walk quietly, take off your clothes, change. And if you're going to sleep, if you're going to study, there is no point, you know, of alerting those who are asleep. Maybe they have an exam tomorrow and they need to grab a couple hours of rest. So you are on the phone and you're laughing and you're joking and you're, hey man, and uh, you disturb the sleep of your roommates. They're gonna pay you back, you know, and that will create hatred. You're living in the same little room and you're hating each other. Islam blocks the means of hatred, envy, conflict, and so on. So the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا جُعِلَ الْإِسْتِئْذَانُ مِنْ أَجْلِ البصر. Keep that in mind. Now, if this is the case, and somebody permitted you to enter your house, stop being nosy. Stop being nosy. We see some people like in the West, once they walk in, uh, they do not just sit down, or if they are being seated, they give themselves the freedom to stand up and wander around I look at the painting, look at the sink, look at the kitchen. Nice kitchen, where? Nice wood, nice, uh, nice stove, nice everything. They look at, they investigate, and that too is not permitted. Only if the host invites you. Let me show you around. So he or she shows you around. Then if you like anything in that house, what are you supposed to do? MashaAllah, may Allah bless you in it. Barakallahu lakum, barakallahu lakum. How did you get that? You're so lucky. Where did you get this from? And all of that, you know, it may indeliberately cast an evil eye or be a, a cause of envy or hasad. But barik. Say Allahumma barik. Barakallahu lakum. Barakallahu laka. Barakallahu laki. May Allah bless you all. May Allah bless you for a male, a male or a female. May Allah bless you in your property, in your house, in your belonging, if you like anything that you see. And only if you are invited. Do not give yourself the freedom to wander around and to look into people's houses and check out their belonging without permission. Whether they see you or they do not see you, lower your gaze. And if you are asked to sit here, in our Muslim societies, there is a, a new trend, and it is very unfortunate. It is contagious. This, the world has become like a small village. You go to rent a flat or to buy an apartment, they, they think it's an advantage. They say, we have an American kitchen, and the flat has an American kitchen. So I always wonder, well, what is the American kitchen? You say, the American kitchen is an open kitchen to the living room, to the hall. So people are sitting and they could see who is cooking, who is fixing the food in the kitchen, and uh, the man is inviting his colleagues or his friends, or maybe they have a private tutor teaching their kids, and the wife or the mother is fixing them the dessert, the tea, and they're chatting. So we may accidentally look at the woman in the kitchen. SubhanAllah, what happened to the Muslim traditions? What happened to even our Arabic cultural traditions, which is the sitr, concealing the awrat, you know? Even in our houses as Muslims in the United States, we close that wall and we make a, a door in it. So the kitchen is for whoever is fixing the food or fixing the dessert or whatever in the kitchen. They're not being seen by the guests. We even make, you know, a corridor or a private door so that my wife wouldn't have to go back and forth in front of people. They wouldn't have to talk and see each other and all of that because this is the Islamic conservative way. You know, not every time 
that you have friends. They have to see your family. They have to see your daughter. They have to see your wife or see your mother. There is no point of that, you know. So that's why we try to cover as much as possible. And this is also the purpose of al then. But when somebody comes in and they shake hands, males and females together, even though they are not related to each other, and uh, to become completely westernized, they exchange kisses and hugs, you know. And he's sitting in the living room, and uh, the host wife is fixing the food. She's chatting with them, with the guests, and they're chatting with her, okay? All of that doesn't have room in Islam. It is not permissible in Islam. إنما جعل الاستئذان من أجل البصر or لأجل البصر The following hadith, hadith number 872 عن ربعي بن حراش رضي الله عنه قال حدثنا رجل من بني عامر أنه استأذن على النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم وفي بيت فقال أألج فقال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم لخادمه أخرج إلى هذا فعلمه الاستئذان فقل له قل السلام عليكم أأدخل فسمعه الرجل فقال السلام عليكم أأدخل فأذن له النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فدخل حديث is collected by Abu Dawood and his sunan may Allah have mercy on him ربعي ابن حراش May Allah be pleased with him, narrated that a man from Bani Amr told us that once he sought permission to enter upon the Prophet Sallallahu at his house. And he said, may I come in? So the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said to his servant or his assistant, go out and instruct him about the etiquette of seeking permission. Tell him to say, first, Assalamu alaikum, may peace be, be upon you. May I come in? So the man from Bani Amr heard what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to his servant. So he immediately said, Assalamu alaikum, O Prophet of Allah, may I come in? So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam then accorded permission to him and he entered in. There is nothing wrong with learning. There is nothing long, wrong with learning. So the idea of may I come in right away doesn't fit. The Islamic etiquette is to give the greeting first. It has been narrated in some hadith that when somebody would come right away and ask the Prophet وسلم, about a question or a mas'ala or wanted to discuss with him any matter. He wouldn't respond to him. He would order him first, say assalamu alaikum. So you greet those who are sitting, whether you are sitting in the masjid or in, in a cafe, or you're going to visit somebody in, in their houses and you have an issue to discuss with them, first begin with assalam. Then after beginning with assalam, assalamu alaikum, ask, may I come in? Do not impose yourself on people. لا تدخلوا بيوتا غير بيوتكم حتى تستأنسوا وتسلموا على أهلها. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, من بدأكم بالكلام أو بالسؤال قبل السلام فلا تجيبوه. Somebody came to you and said, has he called the adhan for asr yet? You're sitting in the masjid. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said, if this person didn't say السلام عليكم to you first, ignore him. The meaning of that, if the person is aware of the importance of giving salam first. But if he is not aware, then educate him. And this is what the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Rib'i ibn Khirash, ibn Hirash, may Allah be pleased with him. So before talking, before asking, even if you're asking, what time is it? Say, assalamu alaikum. What time is it? Even when you're talking to non-Muslims, learn the Islamic etiquette. You meet people and you want to ask about an address in the street. You slump somebody and say, uh, do you know what is a Times Square, please? What about, hey, hi, how are you? May I ask a question? Uh, would you please direct me to where is the Times Square? Or how can I get here or there? You know, you know this is a, a beautiful introduction before just asking for anything.
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us to what is best. I also like the response of this man from Bani Amir. Once he heard the Prophet sallallahu is instructing his servant to teach him what to do, he didn't have to wait to hear it again. Oh, okay, I got it. And he didn't take it personal. He didn't feel bad about it because the Prophet sallallahu is a muallim. And you know, since we're talking about the Prophet is a muallim in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, Ad-deenu an nasiha we are obliged to give an advice to each other and to one another. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned against al-jadal, which is argument. Sometimes you talk to somebody and instead of benefiting from your advice because it is obliged. We, we, we are obliged to give a nasiha to each other. The younger to the older, the older to the younger, you know, the parents to their children, who can give nasiha to the elders, all of that is permissible, but in a gentle way, of course. So, I believe it was yesterday. Um, you know, I was advising somebody at a shop that he was smoking in a small shop, and all of us were being offended. So as I talked to him, he said, why, what is wrong with it? Is it haram? Is it even makruh? It doesn't, uh, you know, it doesn't say anywhere it is haram and it's makruh and all of that. So I kept, you know, explaining to him, both from a medical point of view and from a religious point of view. But I figured that the man is argumentative and no matter what you try with him, it will not help. I said at least for the sake of the passive smokers. Those who happen to inhale the smoke because of you and they don't even want it you know so some people are like that if he is advised to be god fearing he would feel vanity and arrogance you know uh, he wouldn't accept any advice and this is a very despised person may allah guide us to what is best we have learned before how when the jews came to the prophet sallallahu a jewish man said that your people commit some sort of shirk. And he said, how is that? He said, I hear them say, MashaAllah wa mashit. Oh, the Prophet Sallallahu uh, Alaihi didn't take it personal. Immediately he corrected his companion and said, don't you say that, you should say MashaAllah uh, thumma mashit. Okay? You do not equate me to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, and so on. So even if the nasiha, if the advice is coming from anyone, somebody who is in a lesser category than you, uh, he's your junior, he is inferior to you, it doesn't matter, he's one of your employees, benefit from the nasiha of anyone and do not word them off and do not reject it. The following hadith is hadith number 873 and Kildata ibn al-Hanbal radiyallahu anhu qal أتيت النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فدخلت عليه ولم أسلم فقال أي فقال النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم صلى الله عليه وسلم ارجع فقل السلام عليكم أدخل رواه أبو داود والترمذي وقال حديث حسن كلدة ابن الحنبل May Allah be pleased with him. So he's a Sahabi. Yes, that's right. And this is a sound hadith. That's right. He said, I once came to the Prophet وسلم, and I visited him. And I entered his house without seeking permission. So he said, Go back and say, Assalamu alaikum. May I come in? As I said, the Prophet is a teacher. And if he doesn't teach his companions, even though they're grown up, who is going to teach them? And subhanAllah, when he teaches them, they share that with us. Who's Kilda ibn al-Hanbal al-Jamhi? Kilda ibn al-Hanbal was half-brother to Safwan ibn Umayyah. Safwan ibn Umayyah was one of the Meccan chieftains. On the day of the conquest of Mecca, he submitted, but he didn't accept Islam though. Safwan ibn Umayyah ibn Khalaf al-Jamhi was one of the enemies of the Prophet and Muslims and he was very stern against them. He accepted Islam though, but later, after even the Battle of Hunayn. 
and he was one of al muallafati qulubuhum al muallafati qulubuhum those whom the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to treat them with a special extra care in order to attract them to enter islam because those people who were perceived as chieftains and leaders the mala couldn't absorb the fact that all people are the same and they should be treated equally all of us belong to the same father Adam same mother uh, Hawa and because of that they rejected Islam altogether from the beginning because of this idea now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on the day of the conquest of Mecca there was an issue when Hawazin and Thaqif uh, were preparing to attack Muslims so the Prophet Sallallahu needed some arms particularly he needed Duru armors and Safwan ibn Umayyah was one of those who possessed many of them so he said to Safwan A'irni give me your armors as a loan so the Prophet so Safwan ibn Umayyah said Aghasban ya Muhammad are you going to take them forcibly against my will subhanallah and the Prophet Sallallahu if he wanted he could have chopped off his head because he was an enemy combatant and he could confiscated he could have confiscated all his wealth but the Prophet Sallallahu said la bal ariyatan rather it's a loan and guaranteed to be returned back the same and if anything happened to it or we lose any then I guarantee it for you subhanallah so at that Safwan ibn Umayyah gave them to the Prophet as I said later on Safwan ibn Umayyah accepted Islam and so on so Safwan ibn Umayyah sent a gift to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he sent it with whom he sent it with his brother Kilda ibn al-Hanbal I mean with his half brother to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam Kilda ibn al-Hanbal so Kilda ibn al-Hanbal brought the gift and he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and the gift was some milk al-dubba and dhagabis what is dubba and dhagabis the you know uh, there is a specific kind of milk once the she camel gives birth you know the first milk that is milk out of its other is a very special uh, milk that's called lubba and the other is dhagabis is uh, some kind of fruit like cucumbers or baby cucumber so he sent that to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam with his half brother Kilda Ibn Al-Hanbal. Kilda Ibn Al-Hanbal, like his brother, he is new to Islam and he feels like he is doing the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam a very big favor. So he came to his house, to the Prophet's house, and he entered upon him without permission. And like, you know, I'm coming to bring you a gift and from Safwan Ibn Umayyah. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam simply told him, Arja'a. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching us, especially those who are either sponsors, they have workers working for them, maids and servants, or employers, and their employees, their maids are living in the same house. I visit some people and they have a lot of maids in their houses. It is not your right, even though it is your house, to turn the knob and enter the room without knocking on the door and seek, seeking permission. But he is my maid. She is my maid. She's my servant. I own everything in this house. I told you before what the Prophet ﷺ said. Even if you're entering your mother's room, your sister's room, knock on the door. Assalamu alaikum. It's me, your brother. May I come in? Why? Because maybe she's in a position where you don't want to see her in that position. Same applies to your servant. Same applies to your maid. Same applies to your driver. Not because they're living in your hospitality. Because they're working for you. They're resident maids. You don't just seek permission and you allow yourself to invade their privacy at any time during the day or the night. This is what the Prophet ﷺ is teaching us. So he said to Kilda ibn al-Hanbal, Arja, go back. Faqul assalamu alaykum. After saying assalamu alaykum, say, a'adkhul, may I come in? And it is subject to approval or disapproval. 
Very interesting hadith. We'll stop here, brothers and sisters, and take a short break. And that was the last hadith in chapter number 140. And inshallah, in a few minutes, we'll be back to discuss the new chapter 141. So please stay tuned. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Uh, as promised, since we're already also online uh, and live on air, if you have any questions during the segment, inshallah, we'll be more than happy to start answering your questions in the same order they were received. But the priority will be for the questions which are pertaining to the subject which we're discussing. Chapter number 141 in the series of Riyadh al-Salihin is Babu Bayani Anna Sunna Ida Kila Lil Mustadini Man Anta Ayakul Fulan Fayusami Nafsahu Bimayu Arafu Bihi Minismin Aw Kunya Wakara Hati Kaulihi Anna Onahuiha. So this chapter, of course, when we give the English meaning of the chapter or some of the very long titles, we try to compress it and give the summary of that seeking permission to enter by telling one's name and the dislikeness of just simply saying Anna or it's me whenever one is asked who is it who's by the door who is there who are you many of us say it's me or in Arabic they say Anna me the first hadith in the chapter happens to be hadith number uh, 874 the hadith is a highly sound hadith and it is collected by both Imams Bukhari and Muslim and Anas radiyallahu anhu fi hadithihi al-mashhuri fi al-isra qal qal rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam thumma sa'ada bi jibrilu ila al-samai al-dunya fastaftah faqil man hadha قال جبريل قيل ومن معك قال محمد ثم صعد إلى السماء الثانية فاستفتح قيل من هذا قال جبريل قيل ومن معك قال محمد والثالثة والرابعة وسائرهن ويقال في باب كل سماء من هذا فيقول جبريل آه هذا جبريل ومعي محمد the hadith muttafaqun alayh. Anas ibn Malik radiyallahu anhu narrated that in the course of his famous hadith pertaining to the journey of ascension to heaven or al-Isra that the Prophet peace be upon him said then angel Gabriel peace be upon him, upon him ascended along with me to the nearest heaven and he requested for the gate to be opened. That was the first gate, which is the holy heaven, the gate to the holy heaven. He was asked, who is there? So he replied, it's Jibreel. He was asked, and who is with you? He said, Muhammad. Then he ascended to the second heaven and requested for the opening of the gate. He was asked, who is there? He said, it is Jibreel. Then he was asked, who is with you? He said, Muhammad. In the same way, he ascended to the third, fourth, and all the remaining heavens, and there are seven. Until the seventh, at all the gates, at all of the gates, he was asked who is there, and he replied, Jibreel, alayhi salam. So here, brothers and sisters, this hadith is listed in the chapter to teach us even al istidhan or seeking permission, is prescribed among the angels not only the human beings Jibreel alayhi salam is the boss of all the angels and he is the greatest of all the angels so whenever he instructs them they follow his instructions and in the hadith whenever Allah the Almighty loves one of his servants he calls upon angel Gabriel peace be upon him and said O Gabriel, I love so and so. So love him. So Jibreel السلام, would immediately love him. And he will call upon all the dwellers of heaven 
Indeed, Allah loves so and so. You guys got to love him. So all the dwellers of as sama all the angels would love this person whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. So he even communicates a message from Allah to the rest of the angels. And he is a chosen angel to be the messenger of Allah to all the prophets and messengers. So Jibreel alayhi salam is such a, a great uh, creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Man kana aduwan lillahi wa malaikatihi wa rusulihi wa jibreela wa mikala fa inna allaha aduwan lil kafirin. And he specifically mentioned Jibreel alayhi salam and then also Mikael. And the purpose was to reply to those who said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam that we hate uh, angel Gabriel because he's the angel of destruction. It was a statement of some of the Jewish people in Medina to the Prophet and they said we like Mikael or Michael but we don't like Jibreel, Gabriel. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said whoever is an enemy to Allah to his angels to messengers and specifically Jibreel. There is no difference. You do not uh, say I don't like Jibreel and I like Mikael. All of them are Allah's servants. لا يعصون الله ما أمرهم ويفعلون ما يؤمرون. They do not, they do not disobey Allah the Almighty in any command and they do as they were instructed. Okay. So even among the angels, when Jibreel alayhi salam wants to enter into one heaven, it has gates. You don't just go, you know, go through the heavens without permission. So he would knock on the gate of the heaven and he was asked who is there and he said Jibreel. This hadith is mentioned here to teach us, please pronounce your name. Stop saying, Anna, it's me. I know it's you, but I don't know who are you. you don't you know me? I'm your friend. I, you know, well, I don't know you. Right before the program, subhanAllah, I got a call. And number doesn't have an ID, so I don't know who's calling. Yes, how may I help you? Salam. Don't you know me? No, I don't know you. <laughs> Am I supposed to know everyone on earth? And by name, no, I'm sorry, I don't know you. Um, sometimes a person would say his first name, and I don't know that either. You know, give people the benefit of doubt. Say, it's Muhammad, your neighbor. Or, or we met here, or we met there. But Jibreel, السلام, there is only one Jibreel. So when he sought permission, he was allowed. But before that, he was asked, and who is with you? He said, it's Muhammad. In the longer version of the hadith, he was asked, Oh, was he permitted to be sent? Was he commissioned on the prophethood? And they celebrated that. Which also means, very interesting thing, that the angels who are in the heaven have no clue about the unseen. They only learn and know whatever Allah the Almighty informs them with. And if this is the case with the malaika, then what about the jinn? Who are not living in the heavens, are living on earth. Hmm? So the human beings seek the help of the jinn, assuming that they know the unseen and all of that, and this is not true whatsoever. Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the unseen. And he does not allow anyone to know the unseen except whomever he wills. Even the angels. They ask Jibreel alayhi salam, who is with you? They know that somebody is accompanying him. He said, it's Muhammad. Oh, has he been sent already? You know, they know that there will be a prophecy. There was a prophecy about the greatest of all the creation of Allah, the Almighty Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa will be sent by the end of time. But they were not informed. Okay? And when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala informed them in the beginning that he's going to create a vizierant or a khalifa on earth, they had a little objection or they said why what is the purpose this man is going to create mischief and corruption on earth you know he said I know what you know not that's it they submitted he taught Adam all the words then he showed some of these creations with names to the angels and said and be only be asma'i ha'ula why don't you tell me the names of these items or these uh, you know these creations 
glory be to you. You're free from any imperfection. You know everything we know not. We have no knowledge except what you teach us. You're the one who knows everything. You're the all-knowing, the all-wise. Okay, so this is our belief concerning the angels and concerning accordingly anything lesser than them. They have no clue about the unseen. They only know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allows them to know and whatever Allah teaches them. So man ma'ak, it's Muhammad, has he been sent? Yes, first heaven. He goes to the second heaven. Knock on the gate of the second heaven. For us, we haven't seen any of that. But since we already believed in Allah and believed in his messenger, he's communicating the wahi from Allah to us, that's it. Who's with you? It's Muhammad, second, third, fourth, up to the seventh heaven. The hadith is teaching us that don't you say ana, or whenever you seek permission. On the phone, you're talking to somebody, hey, how are you? I'm sorry, who's this? Oh, it's me. Oh, really? I didn't know that it's you. You who? Who are you? You know, I want to share something with you. You know, sometimes when we go for Hajj and I wait by the door of the Haram or here or there, or whenever I'm giving dars and there are, you know, there is a very large volume of audience and the sisters are exiting from their door and many of them are wearing niqab. So I have learned the hard way. Sometimes I was about to get hold of a woman and hold her hand and say, honey, uh, let's go. Then subhanAllah, the last minute, the last minute, it's like I heard my wife is calling me. So I realized that this woman is not my wife. And how do you know that? They're all wearing the cup. They're all wearing the face veil. You don't recognize them. So that's why you learn. You got to be careful, right? So how am I supposed to know that this woman is my wife if I can see her? How am I supposed to know you from your voice if you say, it's me, it's me whom? And with my due respect, you're not my brother, you're not my sister, you're not my wife. So it's hard to remember everybody's voice. I'm not that genius. So give the people the benefit of doubt when you knock on the door and say, the delivery man is bringing the grocery. He rings the bell. Who is this? Anna. It's me. Uh, and who are you? Also add to that when you say, Muhammad, are we friends? Mike. Do we know each other? Have you been here before? No. Who's Mike? There are 10,000 Mikes in the world or in the city. How am I supposed to recognize you? I'm the delivery guy. I'm coming from the HB or the Walmart or I'm coming to fix your antenna. Oh, okay, in this case, I figure out who is there. The purpose of seeking permission is to clarify who is by the door so that I may let you in or I decide Otherwise, it is as simple as that. The Prophet ﷺ is teaching us that whenever you are asked who is there, you should say your name. Inshallah, we'll have a couple more ahadith in the chapter, but since we ran out of time, I will postpone them, inshallah. Till next time, until then, my dear brothers and sisters, I leave you all in the care of Allah. Qulu qawli hada wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Rasulallah, Habiballah, Allah our God is the greatest, the one and only glory to him. He born in humans to be the best And give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest The one and only glory to him He born in humans to be the best And give his best religion to them So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price Rasulallah.